Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues. I'm really honored to be here, and I want to thank you very much for this great opportunity. Today, I want to tell you a story about a wonderful land. Uh, I remember that um, when I was uh, approximately 12 years ago old, I read first time the Tolkien Hobbit book. And I still remember that wonderful feeling when this world opened up to me. And uh, additionally, I, I studied with great excitement these um, maps depicting this world. Today, I will not talk to you about this wonderful fairyland, but about the uh, heritage world. And I think that um, this world is so, so wonderful and uh, nice as the world of Middle Earth. And um, I want to outline you uh, a little map of this heritage world, well, where we spend the next three, three days together. And um, I will um, give you a little overview of this heritage world, and then I will show where is the place of the conservation in this world. My story is intertwined with um, opinions of different people which we collected during the interviews in, in Estonia. I hope that uh, these um, other voices are quite valuable comments on our mostly scientific and, and professional view of heritage. The people and societies um, that exist today are not um, only passive recipients and keepers and transmitters of, of heritage, but uh, rather active, active creators and, uh, and shapers of their, their heritage. Therefore, heritage is always based on the wishes of people and the needs of the society in, in present day. I think it's quite important point that uh, heritage is the present day phenomenon. We all do it, do it together, even at this moment here. Using the terminology of the American philosopher Nelson Goodman, this can be called world building, in the course of which uh, a very ki special kind of world, heritage world, is created. But um, the, our first question is, um, what is the heritage world made of and how it is made? Of course, um, it is made of the components of the actual world. There are no other things which we use. To clarify the idea of uh, the heritage world, I used here a quite famous Leplanc's uh, three-dimensional diagram. And uh, these three dimensions constitute the heritage world. The first um, dimension is, um, is the objects and, and phenomena. The second one is uh, concerned with uh, social organization of society or, or some stratification of, of our society. And the uh, third dimension is, of course, values. In addition to this, um, there are also, of course, um, very close connection with time, but um, this is so, so complicated um, part uh, that uh, today I'm not talking about, about time. Well, take a closer look at these three dimensions. The first dimension is um, objects and phenomena. We all know very well that um, the most diverse objects and phenomena can be included in cultural heritage. Initially, in, in 18th century, when um, such a modern uh, concept of heritage um, was formulated, heritage was understood to comprise uh, some great buildings, churches, castles, and so on, works of art, and other 
outstanding objects from the past, and they were called monuments, antiquities, memorials. Nowadays, what um, people associate to heritage the most with are, in fact, uh, some um, immovable heritage or, or, um, or well, real estate, real estate objects. And of course, here I'm talking in, in our Estonian case. On the personal level, heritage is uh, first and foremost uh, related to the, to the house, the childhood home, as we see in this quotation. And um, we find that uh, places are, are really very important part of heritage of, of Estonian people. This um, personal heritage helps people place themselves um, in the flow of um, time and uh, feel as uh, some part of the, of the tradition. On the community level, the heritage is connected also, some places, some buildings, area where the person were lived, main or buildings, churches. And we see that um, people's lives are closely connected to these, these places. Another important part of heritage is, of course, different objects or, or um, movable heritage. On the personal level, this could be very different uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, items. Photos, jewelry, toys, and so on and so on. There are always um, some sentimental value connected with this, these objects. And, and some of these objects have been inherited from the previous generations, but um, there are also some kind of objects that a person has acquired or, or made themselves, items loaded with meanings that a person wants to hand down to, to the next generations. However, tangible objects um, only a small part of culture, as you know very well. Um, a larger part uh, of culture is connected to the intangible aspects, as um, languages, uh, experiences, behavior, memory, narratives, and, and so on. On a um, personal level, this kind of heritage is mostly stories and tales told by parents and grandparents. And of course, um, Estonian language, which is really very, very important part of heritage for the Estonian people. It is also very common that um, the objects that are important to people are always related to some non-material aspects, as we see in this quotation. At uh, community level, the intangible heritage is connected with um, some local traditions, customs, and uh, of course, local dialects as a set of language in this, in this case, case. It is quite interesting that uh, people often treat the heritage as a whole. And, uh, it seems to me that um, the people's approach to heritage is uh, sometimes more uh, holistic when we compare this uh, with scientific or, or administrative approaches. But um, what about nature? What about uh, natural objects and, and natural environments? Well, one uh, very common way of the 
classifying heritage is to distinguish between a, well, a cultural heritage, and things and objects made by humans, and, and natural heritage, well, those which have not been manufactured by humans. And um, we have, a, as you know, the separate institutions for the nature protection and uh, cultural heritage preservation. But in fact, uh, they are, of course, very closely connected. Personally, I think that um, there are only one heritage which consists of all these different aspects of the reality. And um, at a personal level, natural heritage is connected with uh, some uh, home forests, nature of the home region, very often some, some trees. And um, once again, these objects are very closely related to personal memories and, and experiences. On the community level, this kind of um, heritage is um, very often some uh, natural sacred places, as you see in this quotation, and also parks. And This was uh, examples from the first dimension, from objects and phenomena. If we examine the historical development of this um, dimension, we immediately know that it is characterized by the constant expansion of the range of objects and phenomena that are listed as, as heritage. And this became especially extensive during the second half of the 20th century, well, to name um, industrial heritage, um, military heritage, the 20th century heritage, and so on and so on. Well, that was the first dimension. The second important dimension is the level of social organization. Well, one way of grouping this uh, uh, social levels are seen here, but of course there are different ways to do that. But um, this um, organization is um, very important to take account when we are dealing with, um, with the questions of connected with the heritage. Well, for instance, um, some object um, or phenomenon may be heritage for some, some community, but at the state level it may be not considered as heritage at all. And the definition, function and um, management of heritage differ at various levels of, of society. We may say that um, each level of society has its own characteristic heritage discourse which means that um, there are different ways, ways in which heritage is uh, comprehended and spoken about, as well as how heritage is approached in, in different social practices. People um, usually describe um, the heritage on the personal and on the state level. What is less mentioned is the heritage on the community and on the some well, global level. The most undervalued heritage is clearly the heritage on the local government level, which we, we have in, in our legislation. So there's a special kind of the local government heritage, but people don't know about, about this, of course. Should not forget that um, every person interprets his or her own heritage, regard regardless of whether it's a personal, community, state, or, or world heritage. The giving meaning to heritage is, all, is always a very, very personal thing. And this was about the second dimension. So, Third dimension, uh, which um, characterizes the heritage, is of course values. And the concept of values is inseparably associated with, uh, with the heritage. 
the people choose only some of the infinite quantity of objects and phenomena to be treated as, as heritage. And these um, choices are always based on the values that uh, attribute it to these objects and, and phenomena. There are, of course, many typologies of the values and some examples you see, you see here on this slide. If um, given objects or phenomena possesses these values, these are in fact included in heritage, regardless of, of what these objects or, or phenomena are. Of course, uh, different people have different ideas about heritage and the values heritage is associated with. There is no quite a single and correct approach to heritage that has been presented by experts and legitimatized by the state. Heritage is intertwined with all aspects of our culture and society. And I give some examples here which is connected with the Soviet time heritage and uh, Soviet uh, time landscapes. It's quite common view in our rural landscape. On the one hand, people find that um, as this kind of uh, objects uh, and landscapes are related to the Soviet regime, it would be better if this type of heritage wouldn't exist at all. It's um, better to forget this kind of heritage. On the other hand, it is also found that uh, this is still part of our, our history and uh, therefore also our, our heritage, as you see in this quotation. In order to describe this kind of um, heritage, the term uh, difficult heritage has been used. One of our interviewees used this, this terminology in fact, without being aware of it, that we, we use this in our scientific discourse. And um, this was a very short overview of the map of the heritage world. And I think that this gives more more clear picture of this um, messy world. Our next question is, um, what about uh, conservation in this world? Conservation is, of course, one way of creating and shaping this heritage world. How the conservation um, affects heritage world is um, pretty much changed, of course, since the 19th century when conservation is, um, as a profession as we know it today, developed. The conservation um, approaches are, are some may say that theories uh, can be defined um, as uh, being um, object-based, value-based, or people-based, according to their uh, focus. When we take a look at uh, historical development of these um, conservation approaches, then first was the object-centered approach, then value-centered, and now we are talking about um, and discussing um, the people-based uh, conservation approach and conservation theories. And these um, approaches express an uh, increasingly inclusive and, and more complex approach to conservation, and of course also to the heritage world. In fact, we use them all at the moment. It depends uh, about the context and, and what we need to do and, and so on. And now a little bit overview of this uh, conservation approaches. In the object-based approach, it is uh, naturally the object itself that is the focus of the whole conservation process. 
and uh, what's done with objects depends primarily on its condition and, and uh, damages. It's important to preserve the material side of the heritage object and um, all the treatments are based on the scientific research and the language which we have spoken are mostly the languages of sciences and uh, especially the natural sciences. Of course the treatments are, are managed by the very ethical principles of the conservation as you know very well. Well, there are a lot of uh, international documents and charters uh, where the ideas of the object-based approach found clear expression. But um, in fact, as you know, there are always um, many ways to conserve an object. What are the reasons for choosing one method among many? Which um, presentation of the object should be preferred? The object itself will not provide us with this, with the answers to these questions. And this, um, such an idea has found expression in the next approach, which is the value-based conservation. I think it, about um, 40 years ago, the ideas of the, which related the conservation to heritage value as started rising to the forefront. According to the, this value-based approach, the conservation is, is treated as a social process. And um, the objective of this kind of conservation is to ensure the preservation of values with the help of the conservation of the objects, of course. And um, the decision-making processes related to conservation are managed by experts, but other interest groups are also involved, and we are speaking about um, shared decision-making processes. Well, but um, the material object are still in the focus in this approach also. And uh, this value-based approach has um, clearly gained uh, firm footing in, in conservation today. And here you see some examples of the following of the international charters and documents where the ideas of, of value-based approach found expression. However, when we are dealing with um, values, we found that um, values are not inherent to objects. They develop during the heritage process and depend on the context. When we are assessing values, there are always different problems. And um, it's not possible that, to assess the, all the values and um, all the processes always some kind of incomplete and, and only, only part here. There are many problems associated with this value and based approach and some of them you, you find that they are um, expressed in this interview. And our next question is um, what is the objective of the conserving and uh, preserving heritage more generally? In uh, brief, conservation must be related more to the present day and to the people that uh, give us objects their meanings. And these are, of course, contemporary people. The people from the past are dead, and we cannot research their values and meanings in direct way. Of course, we may make some assumptions about these values and so on, but uh, it's fundamentally impossible to know what the values of people in the future will be. Thus, all that's left is contemporary people. And um, 
It's a new approach to conservation that put people at the center of the entire process is, kno is known as people-based conservation. Heritage is um, linked to people's lives in many ways, and the name of this approach alludes to this fact. And um, conservation must um, strengthen and promote this connection in every, every possible way. Attention is shifted um, to how the conservation process and its results affect people. The focus is no longer on the material object as the carrier of, of different values, but on the community that attributes these values to the objects. And maintaining and forming the well-being and values of contemporary communities manages the entire conservation process. Of course, this um, approach recognizes the locality and subjectivity and, and political nature of, of conservation. But um, how this nice thing is achieved, how can the conservation process be linked more strongly to society? These are really great questions and uh, a suitable answers are still being searched for. So ideas of um, this value and paced approach found expression in following international charters and, and documents. And here you, you see the ICROM living heritage uh, uh, slide, the website. There are quite interesting information. If you have time, please take a look. Well, don't go to conclude. I describe the heritage world by three dimensions. Objects and phenomena, social organization or, or people, and values. Now, after that, I explained um, the conservation approaches. We, um, we see that the three conservation approaches shape all these three aspects of the heritage world. But what next? I don't know. I tried to upgrade uh, a little bit the map which you see at the beginning of my lecture. And I hope that um, this, um, this um, express the idea that um, we must look at uh, conservation as uh, activity of the shaping culture all aspects of the culture, the artifacts, the values and the norms, and uh, the very basic principles of, of culture. Heritage binds people to each other and to the environment, thereby being a part of our world. By relaying on heritage, by constantly recreating it and loading it with meanings important for them, people shape the way societies function. I think that um, the heritage is a way to create a better future for all of us. Well, it's nice to end with that, I think. Thank you for your time. No, please. So, thank you, Kurma uh, no, Does anyone have a questions? regarding this presentation. So I have one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in the beginning of your presentation, you talked about uh, nature or natural um, heritage. Yeah. Uh, in our today's society, we have growing population, we have migration. Do you feel uh, that this natural heritage we're starting to lose it. As Estonians, uh, we know our very um, nature uh, close people. Yeah, I think that the Estonians are not very nature close people. <laughs> it's a, it's a, like a myth, <laughs> of course, and they never be been. But uh, in fact, uh, we're also creating nature. There are no nature without people. 
and not people without nature. And we are now creating uh, nature. There are different kinds of nature, of course. We are trying to preserve some kinds of nature. Mostly this kind is beautiful, as pandas. And we don't, uh, well, like to preserving uh, black rats, for example, who are, well, uh, disappearing in Estonia. But there are not, in, in natural um, views, there are not difference for that. But um, we must think about um, the nature as a, as a part of our human condition, as other heritage, and uh, to shape uh, this as our really home. And, and this depends on us, how we like to shape it. There are always problems with humans, with heritage, with nature. Yeah, that's normal situation in, in human life. Well, thank you, Gurma Gonza, <laughs> very much. Yes. Um, concerning the humans and uh, the human centered, um, I've had several arguments with people over what is and what is not heritage. And one of the recent conversations ended up with the sentence that if nine people out of ten think that this certain house is ugly, then it should be taken down and not considered as heritage. Uh, it was a monument uh, which we were, we were talking about. How democratic can we be about uh, defining and making decisions over heritage? Yeah, well, um, you give an example that uh, nine people think, and it's, it's not a well, very basic idea of the democracy. Democracy is not counting votes, as we think today. If we have a real democratic process, then we must negotiate this and find a way. In day, in week, in years, maybe this monument is, falls down, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> but, that's the, but that's the way, yeah. There are no other, other ways that will put people together and vote about this. It creates more well, problems than it solves, in fact. It's not only in heritage, it's in politics. Or we see it now in Estonia, in other countries. But it also shows the idea that the heritage is closely connected with uh, political processes. You think that it's better managed the heritage when this is not linked with politics. <laughs> and I may agree on this practical side, but in fact it's, it's, it's linked that we have no ways out of this situation. Any more questions? No. Oh, time is over. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Kurma.